Uh, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, please come in if you can find a seat. There's plenty at the front here. Uh, we're going to start the service in just a few moments, so please make your way forward. Very warm welcome to you uh, this afternoon. It's great that you're here, and uh, we're looking forward to a, a great service where you can come and sing with us. So come forward and, and let's stand up and let's sing together.
Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. To look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness the great unchangeable i am the king of glory and of grace one with himself i cannot die my soul is purchased with his blood my life is hid with christ on high with christ my savior Still standing, uh, let's uh, bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, as we gather this afternoon, may our praise to you be acceptable. May our prayers reflect your heart for humanity. May the preaching of your word demonstrate grace and kindness. May the light that Jesus brought shine through us. Help us to love light and not darkness. Capture our hearts with your spirit that we may be transformed to be like Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. I invite you to take a seat, and uh, if you haven't found one, there's still some up the front here. Great to see everyone here this afternoon. Uh, very warm welcome to you. As we have in uh, previous weeks, if you're feeling a little hot and you'd like to get a drink from the back, please feel free to do that. Uh, there's water and the like at the back. There's also bathrooms there. If you'd like to get a Bible, there's Bibles there as well. Please uh, feel free to jump up and, and grab one if you need to. My name is Michael. I'll be leading you through the service this afternoon. It's great to have you here. Uh, if you're new, we'd love to uh, hear from you. We have Connect Cards which you'll find on the seats, please uh, fill one of those out. We'd love to know a little bit more about you. We'd love to connect with you. So if you're new and you want to connect, we'd love to hear from you. Now, uh, we are um, going to send the, uh, the years six to nine to a Bible study in a moment. But before we do that, we're going to do a couple of things. Uh, First of all, we're going to ask um, Michael to, to come up and we're going to have a, a little bit of an interview with him. Welcome him. So, Michael, there's uh, lots of new people who come through this church. and You may know some of them, but not all of them. Uh, tell us a little about yourself. How long have you been at the Good Shepherd and who do you come here with? Yeah, so I've been coming here about eight years, so I think that's... One of, the old, one of the old guard, given how much sort of movement there's been. Uh, we moved into Hughes about then, about eight years ago, and I come here with my wife, Lara, and my two girls, Hannah, who's 12, and Kayla, who's 15. Great. And what do you do during the day? So I'm a lecturer in church history at St. Mark's National Theological Centre, which is the Anglican Theological College over in Barton, just off the King's Avenue there, opposite the... AFP. Uh, I'm also acting director at the moment. We're looking for a new director. So in the interim, I'm doing two jobs without backfilling the other one. I'm sure plenty of you in the public service know about that or other jobs. Great. Now, this afternoon, we're continuing to work our, th our way through the book of John, and we encounter uh, a situation between a teacher called Nicodemus and Jesus. Now, Nicodemus is a smart guy. Uh, but he's probably got every excuse not to uh, see this new guy on the block and follow him. 
you're also a smart guy. You are. You're a lot smarter. Ask my than wife. Than she yeah. might um, debate that. <laughs> How does a smart guy who's got every excuse in the world not to follow Jesus suddenly follow Jesus? Yeah. Now, do you, want to, do you want me to talk about that in relation to Nicodemus or to myself? Start with yourself. Start with myself. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Okay. I'll leave Nicodemus to the experts. I, I can talk about myself, and I'm an expert in myself. Um, well, I think I am, you know. We don't really know ourselves. Um, so, I think I wasn't all that smart. I made a dumb decision when I was around high school. My, so, I grew up in a Christian home, but I stopped going to church in high school, partly because of my passion for music. I was playing in bands and all sorts of musical stuff. So, Sunday mornings, I started doing music rehearsals and doing music stuff. But I finished year 12... And, you know, thinking about university, thinking about the big questions of life and meaning and purpose and value, and actually thinking about time as well. These sorts of questions just intrigued me. So I started that search for those bigger questions. I suspected it had something to do with church and Christianity, but I wasn't sure. So actually my dad had a copy of a handbook of world religions. So I just started this search through world religions and philosophies and and started reading. But around the same time, I started praying. I stood at my bedroom window and said, okay, God, if you're there, show yourself to me. And I waited for a bolt of lightning to happen over Belconnen, but it didn't happen. There was no bolt of lightning. There was no Jesus neon sign in the sky. But what did happen was I started to find that Christians came into my life, and particularly a guy by the name of Jono. In fact, Jono's daughter is with us now, Laura, who is part of our youth group. She might be here tonight. Um, swallowing in her, you know, falling in her seat. Um, But anyway, Jono invited me to a Christian university group. And there, I not only met some smart people, but there was, I realized there was different kinds of intelligence because these guys had a kind of emotional and spiritual intelligence. In fact, I, I found it hard being around them because there was something about the integrity, the humility, the honesty of these guys. There was a kind of, I guess, a different kind of intelligence. But they pegged it back to an encounter with Jesus. And I realized at that time I hadn't encountered Jesus in a real and personal way, but I was more and more intrigued by the person of Jesus. And so I joined a Bible study. Um, John invited me with some other friends to the youth group at Pierce at St. George's Anglican and started going there for a year or two. And at the camp in January 1993, I'm showing my age here, uh, the we had our church camp, and actually Mike was there. That's where we first met at that youth group. And on the last night of that camp, one of our youth leaders just preached a simple gospel message, straightforward gospel message, and I found myself at the end of it on the floor weeping like a baby. And I was, I guess, just really struck by the force of the gospel for the first time in a really powerful way. And I recognized my own imperfection as a sinner before God, but the love of God in Christ. I mean, that sort of uh, blew me away. And some guys came and prayed with me after that. And um, I had what I can only describe as an encounter with the living God in a way that has never happened before or since. Um, But I knew after that that spiritual things were real. There was a real, I prayed to Jesus and there was a real response and power to it. And I guess that began a spiritual journey, but I also had a bit of an intellectual journey that I had to go on after that. So tell us a little bit of that, that as you, you wrap it up. You're now uh, the acting principal of, of St. Mark's Theological College. You don't just get that job, do you? Um, no. It's <laughs> the short answer. Uh, so, I, so I came to faith. I became a Christian January 1993, but I went through several years of what I could describe as a kind of existential crisis. It was as if God had just disappeared. It was a million miles away from me. I felt like, you know, the, the night, dark night of the soul, or sort of walking through a spiritual wilderness. But in that time, that, that drove me to really desperate reading in theology and in philosophy, and that really held me, that, that anchor of Christian theology particularly. Reading guys, especially Augustine of Hippo and Martin Luther, because they went through a similar dark night of the soul and a kind of spiritual and intellectual quest. I had questions about the resurrection and um, various sort of intellectual questions about the faith. But what I found was, uh, as I 
sort of delved into the, the riches of the Christian faith and Christian philosophy, I realized that for 2,000 years, all of these questions had been considered. There was no new question. Um, there's nothing new under the sun. And some of the best minds and best hearts in history had been grappling with these same questions. So the riches of the great tradition of Christian thought in philosophy and theology in particular, I just found immensely helpful through that time. Came out the end of it um, about 15 years ago. And those, I guess those foundations were there as well as, I guess, God making himself known um, in profound ways. So if you had a one-liner for people who are really struggling, coming out of your own experience, what, what would you want to tell them tonight? Well, one thing I would say is that assurance of salvation with God is not necessarily a feeling. Because I really struggled, because everyone around me seemed to have this inner glow. They talked about this assurance, I know that I know that I'm right with God, that, that I'm a Christian. I didn't have that. And I realized, actually, about 15 years ago, actually, God makes himself known. He witnesses to us in different ways, and it's not necessarily a feeling. And I realized, actually, he's made himself known in other ways, through scripture, through people, you know, in all sorts of ways he's made himself known, and it doesn't have to be an inner glow. The great paradox of my whole existence is that once I gave that and surrendered that to God, I've had peace ever since, once I stopped sort of chasing peace and, and just trusting God rather than seeking after peace. Okay, two things. One quick thing. What if people want to go and study more at St. Mark's College? How do they do that? Yeah, well, feel free to chat to me about it or look up stmarks.edu.au. Just look up our website, St. Mark's Canberra. And um, you can subscribe at the bottom of the front page for events. We have public lectures. We have a film and theology night. We do all sorts of sort of outreach events. Um, but if you want to study, we start our semester next week. It's not too late to enroll if you want to dive in. And we do we have single subject study or you can do um, short courses. Uh, we do auditing as well. Um, we're opening my early church history class this semester for auditors if you want to do it without credit. But talk to me or the website. Great. Uh, to wrap up, would you mind praying for us all coming out of your own experience there? Sure. Thank you, Lord, for your gracious in making yourself known to us. We look at you meeting with a rabbi in the first century, with Nicodemus, uh, the great teacher of Israel, and yet he didn't grasp your truth until you made it known to him. And thank you, Lord, for the ways you've made yourself known to me, the ways you're making yourself known to each of us, and in different ways, perhaps different ways from the ways we expect. Lord, give us grace to trust you, in that, Lord, help us to grow in our knowledge of you and help us to grow to be the people that you have created us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mike. That's great. Uh, the Youth Bible Study, if you'd like to move to the back, and uh, we're just going to pause a minute, and you might like to ask the question of the people around you. When you hear the, hear the term born again, what does it come, uh, comes up in your mind?
Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Um, if we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Ronaldo, and I serve as one of the pastors here at Good Shepherd. Uh, there's an opportunity to continue those conversations um, over some dinner, and I think we're going over to Broadburger tonight, so please hang around. We leave at about 6.30 p.m. Uh, for that as well. Well, the year has well and truly taken off, um, and coming up in the month of March, there are a lot of opportunities coming up, so please take out your calendars if you've got them, um, because there's a fair bit happening uh, as well. So firstly, to our, those who are newcomers to us, we want to say we're so glad that you're here um, in and amongst us. We've got an event coming up called Belong, which is next Saturday at Guy's House, which is straight across the road. Um, if you get onto our website and click on Belong, um, please come along to that. I think it's a great way of moving from, you know, the lounge room when you're at the house into the kitchen where some of the more relaxed conversations happen. I think that's kind of my equivalent of Belong as well. Just to kind of sweeten the deal and make you feel a bit more comfortable with Belong, um, raise your hand if you've been here less than two years. Okay, that's about two-thirds of us. Um, so if you're new to us, just know that a lot of us have been in this position in the not-too-distant past. So please come along to Belong. We'd love to just be able to welcome you there as well. Uh, next from me, next Sunday, we're having a big church family dinner. Um, so we're going to be having pizza, but we're looking for each of us to bring some finger food. Uh, there's a slide there, Sunday the 3rd of March, after the church service. These are often a real highlight of the month for me because we just get to uh, really chill out, spend some extended time together, and bond over food, and that's just a really great experience. So please, all are welcome next Sunday uh, as well. I'm going to hand over to Alex. He's got something really exciting coming up. Uh, so let us know, brother. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to ask you guys if any of you have ever felt alone in the Christian workplace. I definitely have, especially as a graduate when I first came here five years ago. And so that's why we're having this Welcome to Canberra brunch on March the 9th. And the reason why we're having that is there are a lot of graduates and new workers that come to Canberra at this time, and we want to tell them that you are not alone, that there are Christians in your workplace, there are Christians in your workplace vicinity, and there might even be Christians in your workplace who are in the very same church that you are meeting at right now. And so this event, it is targeted at graduates and newcomers, but I want to encourage those who are graduates and newcomers to come, those Christians who have been working in Canberra for a very long time, or even for more than one or two years, to come and meet these newcomers, uh, to show them that you are there, that you are a Christian that they can talk to, um, that they can join your church, or that, that they can join your work prayer group. And so what's going to happen is there's going to be a, f a free brunch for new workers slash graduates. We'll also have a time for you know, parliamentarians and senior workers to give a short welcome. And so, yeah, this initiative is the first step with Planted Canberra and St. Mark's, whom we already heard from, to kind of make a new start for workplace ministry in Canberra and to really put some intentionality to it. So, yeah, I'd love to see you guys there. Uh, there's a registration link over there, and I'll post something on the Facebook group as well tonight. Fantastic. Two more from me. Um, I'm telling you, March is a really busy month. Don't you love the health of the food we're putting up on our notices? So, trust me, it's going to be healthy for you. Uh, uh, after that, on the Saturday after that, um, uh, we are part of the Anglican Church, which is a fellowship of different churches. And um, one of the kind of motions I put uh, at our kind of big kind of gathering last year was, wouldn't it be great if different churches got together who've actually been involved in helping refugees settle into Australia? And we're going to have a little bit of a day on the 16th of March, 10.30 a.m. here in this building where we're going to be able to share some ideas and some experiences with how we might have been able to help those who are new to our country. Um, it could well be that there's not a lot happening in this space and that what we need to do is focus in on skilled migration, and um, particularly people coming from India, but these are the people who are often the most vulnerable in our communities, and so it's worthwhile us getting together and hearing from one another ideas that have really stuck and worked as we sought to care for those who are vulnerable to our communities. So please come along to that um, uh, as well. All right, um, and then at the end of March, um, we're going to celebrate the saving grace of God by baptising um, uh, Natalie Miller. 
Um, she has a really amazing story about how God has been at work in her life. And the reason why we're putting this up is because we'd love for you to come as well on the 24th of March, 2.30 p.m. We're going to go down to the lake before this church service. We're going to baptise Natalie there. Uh, she's going to share her story and we'll be able to marvel and rejoice at what God has done. If you are someone that has not undergone baptism, which is a public profession in a very visible way of God's grace to you and how He has saved you from your sins, and you would like the opportunity to do that, please would you come to speak to myself or to Guy, and we'd love to prepare you for that. Um, it's an opportunity for you to be strengthened in the faith and for us to encourage you as well. So please um, put those things in your diary. If you've forgotten all this and I've just wasted my breath, open up the e-news that would have been in your email last Thursday and you'll be able to see these as well. Uh, appreciate your attentiveness to these opportunities and we're going to have the Bible read for us now. Thanks, Michael. The Bible reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 to 21. John, chapter 3, verses 1 to 21. It will be on the screen, but you can also look it up uh, in a Bible or on your phones. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man called Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Verily, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh give, gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at what I am saying. You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does, not, who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light for fear of their, their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so they may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Hear the word of the Lord. Well, thank you, Michael. Uh, I love this church. Uh, you guys are here on the hot Sunday afternoon, and it's wonderful to see you here. Uh, but we have morning congregations and an early afternoon congregation as well uh, with all different kinds of people, different demographics. I want to shout out my brother, Ronaldo, uh, who serves with me and Ben as well and others uh, across the day um, from 8.30 um, in the morning with uh, the, the more older types and traditional, and we get dressed up for that ministry. Ronaldo also has a pretty important ministry at our 10 o'clock family service uh, with our children. Uh, indeed, he leads or co-leads the preschool program with Olivia Leslie, 
uh, and uh, walks alongside uh, Kate in uh, working out the primary program. Uh, Ronaldo has done a great work in that uh, over the course of the last uh, year as well. Uh, and of course, he's the lead pastor here at the Good Shepherd 430 congregation. Um, so, brothers and sisters, uh, we've got much to be thankful for, uh, as much as you and folk like Michael that we've just heard from, uh, what a blessing it is to be gathering together. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to look at uh, this next chapter of John. So, Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunities we have to read and learn together Sunday by Sunday. Uh, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, I will speak your truth and that you will apply it to our lives, that we might glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week, uh, we looked at the wedding at Cana, uh, where Jesus changed 500 liters of water into the very best wine. Uh, and we recognize that uh, chapter 2, verse 11, is a key verse uh, for that miracle, as uh, it gives us a way to interpret what was happening there? If we can have the slide, actually, it would be good for my sermon outline. There you go. Uh, where we read this, chapter 2, verse 11. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now, I suggested that this was a good way in to uh, bear witness to Jesus for your non-believing friends. Just show them the signs and wait for the magic to happen. Have you tried it? <laughs> well, you might have had a go. I certainly, uh, quite a number of times early on in my Christian life, uh, was so excited. I would show my friends, look at this. Look what Jesus did. And particularly look at the resurrection. And I was expecting them to fall on their knees and say, praise God, why didn't I believe in this before? I need to worship Jesus but it didn't happen invariably. Uh, at best, they might look at the signs. They might have read a book or two that I gave them and then thank you very much and walk away. What was the problem? What is the problem? Well, chapter 3 of John helps us get to the heart of the problem uh, with Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. So he is a senior Pharisee, member of the Jewish ruling council, it says, who is obviously intrigued by Jesus' ministry and has perhaps seen or at least heard of the signs that Jesus has been doing. And so he comes on his own to Jesus one night, verse 2, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. That's a good start. But it's not enough for Nicodemus to see or indeed enter the kingdom of God. Jesus starts to expose the problem which uh, we face today as much as Nicodemus was facing for himself. Verse 3, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now, if you've got your Bibles or you've got your devices, uh, you might notice there's a little footnote attached to verse 3. Footnotes are really useful in our Bibles, I've discovered over the years. It's worth reading them. Normally, I don't worry about footnotes, but I'm sure Michael does. Academics need to do that kind of thing. But uh, in your Bibles... The footnote to verse 3 says, the Greek for again, born again, also means from above. Now that gives us a bit more of a way to see what Jesus is saying here. To see the kingdom of God, we need more than intellectual engagement. We need more than religious works. We need, we need more than wonder at the signs of Jesus. We need a miraculous work of God in us to give us new spiritual life. And of course, that's what, again, I'm going to keep going to you. Michael, you were interviewed. That's what happened to you, isn't it? And uh, I'm sure many of us can testify to that as well. 
We need God to change us on the inside. Now, Jesus fills it out a little more a few verses later. Verse 5, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Now, there's no footnote here, but there is the Old Testament background, which is helpful for us for getting a bit more uh, filling out uh, chapter, uh, verse 5 that we've got here. Uh, and in particular, uh, there's a little passage in the prophet Ezekiel, which looks forward to the coming kingdom of God, which I think is really important for us to understand something more of what Jesus is saying here in verse 5 to Nicodemus about entering the kingdom of heaven. So I'm going to read uh, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25. God speaking through the prophet, looking forward to the coming kingdom of God. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. What Nicodemus and anyone needs to enter the kingdom of God, to see the kingdom of God, is for God to wash us clean spiritually and to give us a new heart and a new spirit. Now, how is that going to happen? Well, we're not told. But it's not something we can make happen ourselves. I think you can see that. What we're going to need to do is to pray and ask God to do his work in us. And if not in us, in our friends, in our family, those we want to enter the kingdom of heaven. We need a work of God to change them on the inside. We need to pray. Jesus says it's rather like the wind, verse 8, as you can see there. And this is a simile that works well in the original Greek because again, as uh, you might notice in your uh, footnotes, we've got a single Greek word to mean two things. Wind and spirit is one word in Greek, pneuma. So, there he is playing on this word. And the thing is, you can't predict or control the wind. You can't even see it. But you know it's there from its effects. The sound, seeing the, way, uh, the trees blow in, there in the wind. And so it is with the unseen, miraculous work of the Spirit of God in us. It's not something you can control. It's not something even you can predict. But it's something you can see the effects of when people finally come to know, to believe in Jesus, such that they might see and enter the kingdom of heaven. Without it, it will be like those friends, perhaps, or indeed Nicodemus at this point, who see the signs and then walk away. Well, Nicodemus is pretty skeptical about all of this. He's a leading Pharisee, and they're like the engineers of the ancient religious world. I thought about that during the week. All you engineers, we're Pharisees. I'll tell you why. This is not strictly kind of tight, but it works, I think. The thing is, my understanding of the Pharisees is that uh, they were very practical, and they like things to be predictable so that when you do this, this will be the outcome. And for them, when you obey the Old Testament law, you circumcise, you know, you keep the Ten Commandments and, and you do all these kinds of things, then God will bring you into his kingdom. Or in the more modern case or our context, when my friends see the signs that Jesus did, they will fall down and worship. Do this, that's going to happen. What's this other stuff you're talking about, Jesus? 
Well, Jesus gives a mild rebuke. Verse 10. You are Israel's teacher, and you do not understand these things? And here he begins to lay out more of his credentials, Jesus' credentials, for being the teacher and about how to have eternal life in the kingdom of God. So Jesus may not have been to the very best theological colleges, St. Mark's National Theological Centre, like Nicodemus, perhaps, if he was in Canberra. Jesus may not have mixed it with the top intellectuals of the day, as Nicodemus would have done, a leading Pharisee. But, I have been to heaven, he says, and I have mixed it with God. I know what I'm talking about. I am the teacher you need to listen to. And with that, he goes on and talks more about what is necessary for eternal life. Yes, a miraculous work of God is necessary in us, but we see something else. Look at verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, he's talking about himself, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now you can read about the snake incident uh, back in uh, the book of Numbers uh, in uh, chapter 21. Um, and uh, just uh, the long and short of it is, uh, it was a time when the Israelites were freed from slavery in Egypt. They're in the desert on the way to the promised land. Uh, Moses is uh, leading them as God uh, guides him in that. But they'd had enough in the desert. They were rebelling. They were grumbling against God, grumbling against Moses. And in judgment, venomous snakes came among them and many died. But... The Lord told Moses to make a bronze snake, put it on a pole with the promise that when anyone was bitten and they just looked at the bronze snake, they would be healed. That was God's promise. Jesus sees this as a foreshadow of what will happen to him on the cross. With the equally straightforward invitation promise to believe in him and have eternal life now how does that work well so we come to John 3:16 the most famous verse in the bible without a doubt methinks placards about it all over the place uh, and it fills out for us something more of indeed how Jesus, looking to him and believing him, might bring us eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's the verse, isn't it? Now, the prelude to John's Gospel from the early part of chapter 1 has already given us an understanding that the world is in serious trouble. Uh, it said there back in chapter 1 that the one through whom the world was created, the one for whom the world was created, came into the world, but the world did not recognize or receive him. That sounds like serious trouble, doesn't it? And we see something similar now in chapter 3. If you look down to verse 19, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Friends, we have got a serious problem. The world and how it deals with the creator, who of course is Jesus through whom, for whom the world was created. I would love, I would long for the world to have good prevail. 
that it overcomes the evil that we might see it, as I'm sure all of you would. And we see good everywhere, don't we? Uh, there's a man in Curtin. Um, I'm not sure of his name because he's very shy. We call him Perfect Pete. Who every day is out on his bike picking up rubbish that he sees lying around. So have you seen him that? Yep, you're on your way to the school there. Every day he's there. He's trimming the vegetation that grows over the path. He's doing the best he can to clean off graffiti wherever he sees it. Um, he doesn't get paid for it. Uh, he just is a super good community-minded person. I was wondering, even this morning as I was just going through my sermon, I wonder if he does it on Sunday as well. Well, blow me down. I went for my early morning walk this morning up near your school, Curtin Primary, and there was Pete trimming a branch that was overhanging. And I actually went to him because I thought I'd really like to know his name because I'm going to use him as an illustration in the sermon. <laughs> And as soon as I walked towards him, he just turned around and headed away. So I didn't want to sh um, worry him too much. But, hey, there's good in the world. You could see that in all kinds of places, can't you? On a bigger kind of scale, I was reading about Médecins Sans Frontières recently and their work that they're doing in Gaza at the moment, uh, where doctors and medical staff, well, at times, they're giving their life. Uh, in order to serve in uh, that uh, terrible, war-torn war -torn place. That's good. There is much good in the world. But sadly, good doesn't prevail. Families, communities, nations are constantly in strife, in a never-ending, year after year, century after century, millennia after millennia cycle of sin. And John tells us, as Jesus tells us, the world is in opposition to its creator. The creator can't stand for it forever. There has to be a judgment and the world will be condemned which is terrible news for all of us. For we will all perish in this judgment. But the truth is, God so loved the world that he gave the most precious thing he has to give us eternal life. God gave his son to hang on a Roman cross that we might be saved for eternal life. Now, there is much more to be said about this, of course, through the rest of the gospel. We're yet to see how it's all going to work out. We're yet to hear exactly how Jesus, being lifted up on the Roman cross, indeed saves us from perishing. But that's what the rest of the Gospel of John is going to be doing, as indeed the rest of the New Testament. But at this point, it's enough to know that God has done it. And what is required is for us to believe in Jesus. Not, not to intellectualize, uh, not to study and question and doubt. Can you imagine standing at the foot of the cross and doing that? Hand in hand with God's miraculous work in us, we are asked to believe. Like the Israelites had to believe in God's promise, look at the snake and you will be healed. This is what is needed for eternal life, that we might enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, he's a good man to see and to follow. He only comes up actually three times in the New Testament, in the Bible. Uh, three times in the Gospel of John. And it's quite interesting noticing each time. And I think we're supposed to notice it. First time, here he is. He's in the opposition. He's skeptical. He's kind of um, questioning with Jesus. He is a member of the council, resistant to change. But he's at least a bit interested. And then... 
later on, halfway through the gospel, he comes up again. And we find him tentatively standing up for Jesus, actually, when the rest of his colleagues were out to get Jesus. And, and Nicodemus gives a bit of a defense and say, well, this is probably not a right way to go to kill him. And then he makes one more appearance at the end of the gospel when he goes with Joseph of Arimathea to get the dead body of Jesus off the cross to make sure that Jesus has a decent burial. Now, obviously Nicodemus had been on a journey. We trust that he would have been one of the first witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus because he was that concerned about the burial of Jesus. He would know about the resurrection. We trust that he came to believe and indeed came and entered the kingdom of God. But it is a journey, of course, that we must all take if we're to have eternal life, moving from opposition to believing. Yes, it requires a miraculous work of God in our lives, and for that we must continue to pray. Pray you may not be yet a believer. Ask God to come into your life. Maybe he will give you the flashes of lightning. But usually he doesn't. But he does change your heart and mind. Pray for your friends, your family, that God will do that miraculous work. And then that goes hand in hand with the responsibility we have and a readiness to believe in Jesus as Lord and Saviour. I don't know where all of you stand with this this afternoon. I trust and believe and understand most of you are believers. God has done that miraculous work in you, giving a new heart, new soul. But there may be some who are still on the fence, not ready yet. Don't delay. It's really important. The judgment is coming. We don't want to perish. We want to be saved for eternal life. Friends, you need to put your faith in Jesus and do it this afternoon. We're going to have a little opportunity, I guess, to do that uh, when uh, Michael will lead us in a confession of sin. Um, and uh, if you want to talk, to more, uh, talk more about it, uh, you might like to speak to me, speak to Ronaldo uh, this afternoon, speak to Michael, um, and uh, it would be wonderful to hear from you. So I'm going to invite our musicians to come forward as we sing our next song. Friends, let's stand as we sing of our wonderful Jesus together. Great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the dark. Down from 
from glory to bear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken. I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful for two questions or comments indeed if you want to put up your hand Ronaldo has a microphone I'd be pleased to hear from you Sarah hello thank you guy um, yeah I was reflecting on one of the strands today I'm um, talking about assurance and I suppose the um, gravity of what it means to be born again um, and have um, a new heart Yes. put in us um, and thinking about what you were saying particularly about um, I suppose the Pharisees approach um, but also um, I guess the tendency that in Christian communities you often have to make it look like a certain thing to come to know Jesus or even to I guess in other writings in John think about the extra spiritual experiences you need how would you encourage us to I guess lean into Jesus and that assurance in the day to day, um, particularly with friends who are particularly, or, or those of us who might be grappling with, mm. I guess, the significance, but also just the simplicity of meeting Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sarah. That was an encouragement, indeed. Anyone else? Oh, so there was a question in there, Guy. There was a question. So, how would you, um, yeah, how would you? encourage people to lean into Jesus. Both, oh, how would we encourage? Yeah, right. both into the simplicity of what he's done for us, um, because obviously within Christian circles, we, we make it out to have a certain type of experience to be a certain way. What does it mean to kind of lean into the assurance that Jesus has for us with salvation? Uh, I Look, uh, Sarah... 
I think that it's important that we, um, uh, in, in having opportunity to encourage believers and non-believers, that we um, make Jesus known. How we do that is, of course, opening up the word that we have uh, in, in the Bible and, and doing that uh, in a way that allows a person, uh, I guess, to engage with what God has said, uh, engage with Jesus as uh, he comes to us through his word. Um, and, uh, you know, th th there's time and a place for, for doing different things that we might uh, have opportunity with uh, friends and those we need to deal with and talk to, uh, even ourselves. Um, how you approach it, I think it will depend a lot on the context um, but, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to be over, you know, we don't want to be uh, kind of pharisaical and sort of say that you, if, if you just do this, this, and this, it'll all be good. Um, a, a prayer is such an important part of all of this, uh, praying with each other, for each other. Um, and um, so there are some comments, but... Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm happy to, to follow it up more with you, Sarah, later, but uh, maybe it's a hot, stuffy afternoon and I missed uh, the question and all of that. Here we go, Robin. Hey, Guy, thank you. Part of my thinking in response to what Sarah was saying, but also in listening to what you said, but also listening to Michael's testimony too, is that each of us meets Jesus in a different way mm. and he works in our lives differently. So I didn't have big, bold experiences of fall, falling down in tears and meeting, having a real meeting with Jesus. I just know mm -hmm. that Jesus is there mm -hmm. and that he is my saviour. And so, and that's from reading and from listening to others. So could it be that well, the way we lean into Jesus is that we pray pray heartily and constantly for those that we love that don't know Jesus mm. and that we listen to the experiences of others so that we understand that it doesn't have to look like something in particular. Yeah. Then we, and we keep p pushing people back to the Bible so that that's where they meet the Jesus that stands in their life for them. That's not a question, is it? I, I can it's affirm it and say it's yes. <laughs> Robin, I'm with you, sister, and I think uh, that's useful for us to hear. Thank you so much. As Guy said, as we are accustomed to each week, we have the opportunity to pause and confess our sins. Forgiveness is a, and new life is a sweet thing indeed. As we go into that prayer, there may be some who haven't prayed this before, or maybe it's a, a new thing for them. But hear these words. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. If you feel able, I encourage you to say this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an... No, sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And hear these words of assurance. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's the perfect offering for our sins, not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. If you've prayed that prayer for the first time, and you have a sense of forgiveness for the first time, I'd encourage you to go and tell Guy or Ronaldo and, and talk to them about that. We're going to continue in prayer with Mary, who's going to come and lead us. Hi, everyone. Um, 
Before I start, uh, if you would like personal prayer for anything big or small, uh, after the service, I'll just be over here on your left and would be really happy to pray with you. Now let's bow our heads and talk to God. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for gifting us your word, which allows us to know, love and live for you, as through it you reveal yourself to us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, whom you have given us so that we can be born again washed clean of our sins and made new as your children who have the right to enjoy you forever. We praise you for the great and awesome God that you are. You made the heavens and earth with only a few words. You carefully crafted us in your image to rule and care for this world that you made. But Lord, we've corrupted and tainted your beautiful creation with our rebellion against you, trying to make ourselves our own rulers. We are so sorry for rejecting you as our Lord and ask for forgiveness in your mercy. And by your grace, we know that you have not kept us far from you. Thank you for sending your precious son, Jesus, the Christ, to come down to us to save us from your righteous wrath by taking our place on the cross. Thank you that because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we're freed from death. And just like we're doing now, we can cry out to you as Father. As our Father, we ask that you'll be with those of us who are sick, injured, hurt, lonely, depressed or suffering from any other affliction. Please overflow your grace onto us. Uh, Give us the strength to keep trusting and rejoicing in you in all circumstances. And Lord, if it's your will and we're suffering from these afflictions, please bring healing and peace. Lord, we ask that your spirit will continually work within us that will grow and transform to be more like your son. Help us to grow in love for one another as brothers and sisters. Help us to constantly look for ways to serve each other and to serve you. Help us to disciple one another in your word, especially the young in our church family. And help us to spread the gospel to those around us who don't yet believe in you, our friends, family and colleagues. Give us the courage to invite them to read John with us so they can find out more about you. And please, Lord, give us the words to say, the attitude to put on, and the actions to do so that we can bring glory to you always. Lord, that we ask that you'll be with our fellow Christians around the world who are being persecuted for calling you their Lord. Please sustain their hope in you, that we'll all be with you forever in perfect joy when your son returns. And lastly, restore to us the joy in your salvation. Uphold us by your generous spirit so we may meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Let's join together now as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to ask the musicians to come up now. Church, let's stand together as we sing our final song, which reflects on the good news in John 3.16.
for those in Christ, we hear from the book of 1 John. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. With that, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Remember, if you'd like to join us at Broadburg or at Fishwick on Dairy Road, uh, please do. And also you can talk to Ronaldo and Guy if you'd like to. Thank you for being here.